So I picked the title of this talk just like talking to a person because uh, I've certainly said that many, many times since 1996 or whenever and about uh, automated systems. And I wasn't lying. I was certainly sincere about my systems being able to talk just like a person, but, but I, there, I think there was some aspect of wishful thinking involved. And I think people are still saying that about their automated systems. And I think there's still quite a bit of, of wishful thinking even today. Um, so I, what I'm going to hopefully do today is show you some ideas for things where we can make progress toward this goal of being just like talking to a person and really even where, how much do we really want to achieve of that goal. Uh, maybe there's um, a related goal that's not mimicking a person but um, making a system that is even better than a person in some ways. Um, so it's interesting that people have been wanting to talk to their artificial creations for a long, long time. I have a few examples. Uh, the uh, data character uh, from Star Trek, C-3PO from Star Wars, even going back to the 19th century, the character Pinocchio, that um, his creator uh, carved a puppet out of wood and it became a real boy. Um, this is a, and then we have characters from The Wizard of Oz and we have um, toys that come to life like the Velveteen Rabbit. People, people really are intrigued by this idea and even going back to ancient times, they've been trying to bring their creations to life. Up until now, this has always, always been fiction. Um, the, all these, Pinocchio and the Velveteen Rabbit, all these, these creations have been fiction. Um, but now it's much more real. Uh, we, can, we have uh, the smart speakers, we have virtual assistants uh, that we can talk to pretty successfully a lot of the time. But are they really like talking to people? Uh, how, how far away are they from talking to people? And what do we need to do to make them more like talking to a person? So let's step back for a second and say, well, what is it? Why, why do we want to do this? Um, of, we've seen this kind of human, um, human desire to talk to our creations. But there's several other reasons. Um, first of all, there's a scientific perspective. Let's just do some basic science and trying to, trying to talk, create something that we can talk to and interact with. Um, there's a practical motivation. We can get uh, these artificial creations to do things for us. And then there's an emotional motivation that you hear sometimes um, in advertising for different uh, different types of uh, artificial agents um, that they'll satisfy some emotional needs that people have. Uh, so the scientific motivation is, is kind of the same motivation that there is for all science. We want to see if we can do it. Uh, that's a bit kind of a basic scientific curiosity. We want to understand the challenges and try to, try to uh, understand the basic mechanisms of speech and natural language and dialogue understanding. Um, that's kind of the, the motivation really for all basic science. Um, we also want to be able to better understand people. So if we, the thinking is if we can imitate, uh, recognize speech or understand natural language, that will help us understand the people that we're trying to um, trying to imitate. And then the third uh, motivation for scientific work is to spin off useful technology, which in our case is probably practical systems that do things for us. And that's what um, everybody says, no matter what their field of science, whether it's um, NASA or basic biology or any kind of science, one of the re ways they get funding is that they say, well, we're going to spin off some useful technology from this basic science. And it's, that's, it's true. And um, 
we want to spin off useful technology. So the second, the second uh, motivation for doing this kind of um, work is a practical one. This is, I would say, by far the most common and probably applies to everything in the speech tech show and the vast majority of, of presentations. We want systems that can do some of the tedious work that requires speech recognition or natural language understanding uh, so that people can avoid um, doing work that they don't like. Um, along, going along with that is the idea of saving money on salaries and training for people. Um, if a system is doing it, then they, you don't have to pay a human to do it. Um, on a more positive note, a system will do work consistently. It might not do great work consistently. It might not be up to human quality. But one thing you can know is that it's going to do the same thing over and over again. And if people have not been trained thoroughly, or they're tired, or they're making mistakes, um, a, a system won't do that. Um, Another practical motivation is to do things that we can't do. Um, we can't remember 150 items on our grocery list. Uh, we can't uh, go to Mars and drive around on the sand. Um, we can't you know, control 100 lights uh, with one uh, command. Um, there, we can't go into tiny little holes, like a robot that can go into tiny little holes and, and uh, you know, look for things. Um, so a, a lot of cases, the system, because it's not, it's not, um, it could be any size or shape we want. It doesn't need to breathe. It, it doesn't, um, maybe it needs power, but it doesn't need to eat. Um, they can do things that we can't do. Um, we also, another practical reason is to save time and effort. Um, doing things like scanning through thousands of hours of video, looking for keywords. Um, people can do that, but it's difficult, it's time consuming, and um, they make mistakes. And then another practical reason is doing things when people are not available, like off hours and um, on Mars. Um, so there's, all, there's a whole bunch of practical, practical reasons to develop systems that can do some of these human abilities. So I picked a few practical examples. I don't know how visible that is. And um, so I'll pretty much, I'll just go over them. Um, I took a look at the websites for Amazon Alexa and uh, Siri and Google Assistant and looked at why, why these companies want us to use their software. So Alexa says, hands-free. <coughs> Voice control lets Alexa hear you from across the room, even when music is playing. Play your favorite songs, get the weather, and more. Just ask. Those are all practical, practical goals. Uh, Siri says, Siri is a faster, easier way to do all kinds of useful things. Set alarms, timers, and reminders. Get directions, review your calendar. Siri can do it all without your ever having to pick up a device. Based on your routine, Siri can even anticipate uh, what you might want to need to help you breeze through your day. And similarly, for the Google Assistant, uh, the website says it can um, uh, do tasks and keep track of to-dos, communicate, give you local information, give you quick answers, um, tell you about music and news, give you and play games. Playing games is maybe not. Um, it's probably the least practical of all those. Um, but but the, for the most part, the emphasis is on doing practical jobs. The third motivation is, is it's very interesting. Um, it's the emotional motivation. So there's the idea that this artificial creation can be a friend. It's always available. It doesn't have human problems like, like judging you or gossiping about you to your other friends. It's always listening. It never bothers you with its own problems. Um, and ideally, it doesn't have any human flaws uh, like bothering you, or, or hopefully its personality is not very uh, not annoying like some people. It doesn't need anything from you, but it's this great friend. 
I think these are the motivations that um, Geppetto had when he made Pinocchio. He wanted, he wanted a son. Um, and uh, he was looking for some kind of emotional connection with, with Pinocchio. So there's a few products that appeal to this emotional side of artificial creations. Um, there's two that I, that I are pretty well known. One is called Jibo. Um, unfortunately, G Jibo um, has gone out of business, but their website is still there. And uh, they say, Jibo's personality shines in everything he does, from his dance moves to his jokes, his charming disposition and unique character makes each interaction special, helpful, and surprisingly human. There's some aspect of being helpful in there, the practical, um, practical motivation. But for the most part, Jibo is going to be a, a little friend. And he's going to be very cute and have a nice personality. The other website, this one is still in business, is called Hanson Robotics. And um, they answer the question of why human-like robots? Uh, robots will soon be everywhere. How can we nurture them to be our friends and useful collaborators? OK, there's the practical motivation. Uh, robots with good aesthetic design, rich personalities, and social cognitive intelligence can potentially connect deeply and meaningfully with humans. Uh, so they're really emphasizing this emotional aspect to the artificial creations. Um, in neither of these cases, do you see anything on the website about why, why do you want an emotional connection with a robot? Uh, I think they just kind of take that as a given and um, assume that that is a desirable thing to have. So, uh, so we have the practical, scientific, and emotional motivations for making a system just like a human. Um, so let's, let's take, take a look for a second at um, what is a, what does a human, what can a human do? And I, for this question, I went back to the 19th century and I looked at the pseudoscience called phrenology where they were predicted people's personalities and abilities by looking at bumps on their heads, which um, incidentally is, doesn't work. Um, but um, there are a lot of, a, a lot of, you know, characteristics of people that we still, that we still have. There's self-esteem, firmness, um, friendship, uh, acquisitiveness. There's some bad ones, acquisitiveness and uh, destructiveness. But really, so far, we have only, I don't know if we want these, but the ones that we've really focused on are very small among all the characteristics of people that the phrenologists looked at. And I don't know if you can see which ones I've highlighted there. There's memory, calculation, and language. So this uh, 19th century view of what people are like is really um, much, much broader than, um, than what we have in, in today's systems. There might be some things in there that we do want to broaden. There's, I'm sure destructiveness is not one that we want to add to our artificial creations. Um, but we've really only, today, we've really only explored a few capabilities. So the next thing I want to do is move to looking at where we are now and where we can go. So I looked at the, uh, what you might call the three pillars of conversational systems, speech, understanding, and conversation. The speech recognition and text-to-speech, natural language understanding and generation and conversation or dialogue. So um, we'll take a look at each of those. Uh, this, I'm going over the state of the art very briefly to concentrate on, on the future. So where are we now? Uh, speech recognition works very well um, for the best cases, the quiet environments, the English, the careful speakers, the adults. Um, and I don't know if anybody went to um, uh, Jeff Adams' presentation yesterday, but he gave a, a really nice uh, layout of how different factors in the speech environment affect the success of speech recognition. So going to the easiest possible situations, speech recognition works very well. 
and going to the more difficult situations, we, we, the, the noisy children talking over each other, um, speaking multiple languages, that kind of really hard situation, we're, we're very far from being able to, uh, to do that. I'm gonna assume that everyone has interacted with Alexa and Siri and Google Home. And if it, has anyone not? That, okay, they're pretty ubiquitous now. Um, so most of the examples I'm going to give are from, from uh, Alexa and Siri. Um, and uh, we'll see cases where they do a very good job and cases where they don't. So moving on to the second pillar of conversational interaction, natural language understanding. <clears throat> um, they can do a really good job at what I might call generic information. Um, that's kind of, you know, information that is pretty pervasive within, within a culture. So I asked Siri a question. Um, Alexa, oh, what was the Phillies Alexa. record in 1956? In the 1956 regular season, the Phillies had a record of 71 and 83. They're all very good at sports information for some reason, but th this is a, it's a generic, generic information that um, pretty much every, any, um, most Americans could probably, um, uh, you know, kind of, they could, they could probably ask, well, they have to be a Phillies fan, but they could ask it about other teams and they could ask about long, long ago, and, and uh, Alexa was right there. It was sitting there waiting to be asked. Um, as far as dialogue goes, the third pillar of conversational interaction, they're all very good at, at um, the kind of what you would call a one and done, which is not really even a dialogue. It's just ask a question, get an answer, things like the weather, the temperature, the time, um, there's uh, things that you can just ask once and get the answer to. Um, they're very good at that. When slightly more um, sophisticated dialogues are what, what you could call follow-up, and they, um, that's where the, you ask a question and then, then kind of say, well, what about some other, um, some other thing, like, without mentioning what you're interested in. So, so a better way to look at that is to um, find an example. Where is it? Alexa, what's the weather gonna be like tomorrow? Weather alert for Plymouth meeting. There's a tornado watch in effect until Friday, <laughs> April 26, 9 p.m. Here's the forecast for tomorrow. Look for partly sunny weather with a high of 60 degrees and a low of 45 degrees. Alexa, how about Washington, D.C.? Weather alert for Washington District of Columbia. There's a tornado watch in effect until Friday, April 26, 9 p.m. Tomorrow, you'll see mostly sunny weather and can expect a high of 68 degrees and a low of 54 degrees. So I didn't say anything about weather when I was asking about Washington, but, um, Alexa knew that I was talking about weather and it gave me the information that I was interested in. And that's the information that all of you would, would, um, would expect if I asked about weather in Philadelphia and then I asked about Washington. Let's try another one. Oops. Alexa, what time is it? The time is 1.57 p.m. Alexa, how about in New York? New York. New York was founded in 1624, <laughs> 395 years ago. So um, it's got, somebody sat there back in, um, at uh, Amazon and typed in weather follow-up, but they forgot to type time follow-up. Interestingly, Siri actually does do the time follow-up, but it, it doesn't, doesn't mean that either one of them really has a general idea of what a follow-up question is. Um, the third kind of dialogue that's the state of the art is slot filling, which is when you ask, uh, let's say I asked a question like, um, I want to make some travel plans, 
you can't really answer that question without um, getting some more information from the user where they want to go, when they want to go, uh, where they're leaving from. So the paradigm is going back through that task and saying, okay, where do you want to go? What, um, when do you want to go? Where are you going? Um, so those are kind of slots that you fill in during the conversation. And that's a pretty, um, pretty well understood dialogue uh, paradigm. What you don't find is, uh, we'll see a lot of things that you don't find actually, but um, they're starting to do things like at least be able to chain together several slot fillings. So uh, travel planning is a good example. Maybe you make a plane reservation and then maybe move on to a related task like hotel reservation and then move on to another related task like car reservation. You can, uh, there are systems that will let you chain, chain together those individual tasks. Uh, so that's, that's good. Alexa. Oops. What was the Phillies record in 1956? Okay. In the 1950s, oh, no. regular season. Never mind. What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Weather mm -hmm. alert for Plymouth meeting. Alexa. There's a tornado watch and expected until Friday, April 5th, 9 p.m. Alexa. Alexa. How about in New York? Look for partly sunny New weather York. with a high of... <laughs> okay, so now I want to talk about some of the ways that, that I, I see. These are perfect all my opinions um, about where improvements are possible. And we can look at improvements in, in, from two different perspectives. One are sort of fundamental scientific advances versus just doing some more work. Um, I'm trying to um, uh, focus a little bit on the things that, that we just haven't done yet. They're not, they don't require uh, a fundamental uh, academic research effort, they're just things that we have to do. Um, so we're going to start with the kind of the easiest, I guess. Um, and one thing that's really great about today's artificial systems is they know a lot. And we saw that example with the, the Phillies. Um, they know a lot about um, generic information. Um, and they, there are a lot of resources for generic information. Uh, I think knowledge graphs are the most popular. Uh, there's also the DBpedia, which is kind of a structured version of Wikipedia. Um, there's a Wolfram Alpha and uh, another academic one called Psych. There's a lot of generic knowledge available in structured forms that we can tap into with, um, uh, to build these systems. But they're already pretty good with generic knowledge. Where they're, start to um, be less good is, um, well, first of all, enterprise information. So you can't just go to some website and find out about your company's products and inventory and employees and retail locations. That's all something that has to be taught to the virtual assistant or if you wanted to build an enterprise application that could answer those kinds of questions. Um, so most of the time, a lot of that information is in databases, um, and the problem is hooking, hooking that database up to the virtual assistant. And that can involve a lot of work. Um, the other kind of information that's hard to get is um, is personal information about the user. Um, that's how, you know, do I, how do I take my coffee? What's my route to work? Um, any kind of personal information that's useful in an application. We don't have a good way to acquire that. I can see three ways to acquire it. None of them are perfect. Uh, one is to, when the user sets up an application, go through some kind of quiz, uh, which can get really t tedious. Um, you know, what's your name? Do you have any siblings? Uh, what kind of car do you drive? Uh, tell me about your route to work. Uh, people don't have a lot of patience for that. Um, the other one is, the second one is the system can learn through interacting. And, and that can um, be used to learn things that, that maybe the user doesn't even, isn't even aware of. 
um, like their average commute time, maybe they don't really pay attention to it, but the system can learn that. Uh, the problem with that is, is it needs to be set up to do that, and it might take a while to learn all the things that it would be um, good for it to learn. And the third way to get information about the user is mining the web for information about you. Uh, that's pretty creepy. Um, people, I don't think you would be very happy if your virtual assistant suddenly said, oh, how's your, uh, how's your sister Gretchen? Uh, I see she posted on Facebook. Um, people are used to uh, the automated systems knowing where they are. Uh, so that's not, that's not too creepy, but there's a lot of information about everybody on the web, and I don't, you have to be careful about mining it. Um, so uh, that's knowledge. The next one is language, and I think in most cases, um, uh, language is, is, getting better language understanding is an incremental uh, in most cases, it's kind of an incremental task. So um, getting, um, being able to process more complex language, uh, like alternatives, like are there any Mexican restaurants near here besides Plaza Azteca, or how can I get to Philadelphia without going on the Schuylkill? Um, those are, I, to me, those are just a matter of the uh, developers saying, okay, we want to handle alternatives. Um, the same thing for possibilities. You know, is, is there a Mexican restaurant near here that's open now? That's a question about a possibility. Um, Multi-intent is a really, really useful technology or really useful feature. And that, um, that refers to things like um, the user asks two things in the same question. People are working hard on that. Uh, because it's very natural for, for you to um, uh, say things that are really two, two tasks, like, is there a Mexican restaurant near here? And if so, make a reservation for me at 1 o'clock. <clears throat> There's two jobs that you're doing with your, um, with your artificial uh, assistant. Um, what, one that I think is, is really, really hard is a general inference. So uh, all of the the Siri and Alexa and Google family will answer questions like, do I need an umbrella today? Um, that they take that as a, as a weather request. And that sounds really cool. It sounds like it's so smart. Um, but, but actually, those have been hard coded in, um, back, in the back end. And the, the way that you know that they're not doing a general inferencing job is to ask them something a little bit more off the wall. So if you ask them um, uh, something like, can I wear flip-flops today? You have to know what the weather's going to be like, if it's going to be warm enough for flip-flops. And you, well, you also have to know what flip-flops are and that they're kind of open and your foot is out and exposed. So if it's cold, you don't want to wear flip-flops or if it's raining. Um, and you also need to know if someone has a lot of business meetings uh, you don't wanna, you want to. You need to wear normal shoes to a business meeting, I, I think. And, and you know, maybe businesses are getting more casual, but uh, maybe not that casual. So to answer that kind of a question, you need to do some kind of general reasoning about about really arbitrary knowledge, like what is appropriate business uh, business wear. Um, if you, I tried these. Um, uh, with Siri and Alexa, and Siri was actually, I'm not sure why it did this, but it actually did give me a weather report. Um, Alexa just said, I don't know. Uh, so what you would like is some general, um, general ability to reason about knowledge, which is very far away from, from, uh, uh, from being executable. And the last one that uh, needs a lot of work, I think, is inferencing about time. So if you said something like, if I paid my bill yesterday, will my payment have arrived before the due date? Um, that, that would be very difficult with today's technology. 
The next one, there's a lot of work on detecting user state, a lot of really interesting work um, that I think is another thing in the category of things that people are working on and they just need to keep working on. Um, detecting emotion is, um, is, is getting a lot of work and it, the state of the art I think is in about the 80% range. Um, there's open source emotion detection um, and you can use many, many different uh, modalities to detect emotion. I'm really talking about voice, but detecting emotion from face, facial expressions is even, uh, works even better than voice. Um, uh, Microsoft has a, has a uh, cognitive service for emotion detection from face. Uh, detecting cognitive state is another interesting user state. It's slightly different from emotion, but it's often uh, a little bit mixed up with emotion. So user states are more things like um, confusion, uh, frustration, uh, surprise, which are kind of, kind of gray, whether they're user states or um, emotions. Something like just comprehension might be a, a clear case. It's not an emotion, but if you can see that someone is understanding you, that's a, that's a very uh, useful thing to know. Detecting deception, there's a lot of work on that. I think there was a, uh, might have been a panel yesterday on, on uh, deception. Um, and detecting diseases, many, many diseases affect our speech, um, helping, helping diagnose uh, different diseases, especially a disease that's um, something like Alzheimer's, that's, it's very good to, um, to um, detect it at an early stage. So there's a lot of work on this, and um, there's at least one report where they were, uh, Toronto researchers were able to detect Alzheimer's with an accuracy of 81%. Um, so there's, that's a kind of really important research area. Um, next one is learning. Um, learning, uh, learning language, learning information by um, just reading documents. Uh, it's kind of a holy grail. I don't think it works very well yet, but wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to teach people or teach systems, but you just said, okay, uh, read the manual, and then you'll know all about this, this, um, uh, this product. Uh, or just tell them things. Uh, there's, I still, we think we still have a way to go there. And then uh, going back to what I was talking about a few minutes ago about enterprise applications, uh, there isn't really a lot of, it's not really easy to learn about, about new domains like your enterprise. Um, maybe some reading the manual of your, about your databases, might, maybe you could do that or, um, or mine the, uh, APIs, I don't, know how, I don't know how to do that, but, but it would be really useful. We can also talk about dealing with bad audio situations. Um, again, uh, Jeff Adams' talk yesterday was very good about bad audio and, and good audio, and um, some of the big problems are separating multiple speakers, speaker di diarization, is what it's called, it's separating multiple speakers that are talking at the same time, or even not talking at the same time, but, but um, going um, back and forth in some, a situation like a meeting uh, or um, even a, a classroom lecture transcription would be great to be able to do. Um, it doesn't, it's still a very early technology. And um, dealing with noise, noise is always bad for speech recognition. We're good at dealing with some level of noise, but there's always, there's always more noise. Um, and we still need, need uh, techniques for dealing with noise. Multimodal input is another one where I think, I think a lot of multimodal input could be handled if there was a, a, you know effort at handling multimodal input. So here's one where, here's an example where we're um, um, integrating voice with camera input. So the camera is showing an image of this um, visitor and 
the person says, oh, who's at the door? The camera takes a picture of the visitor, goes to, this is a service called blipar.com that identifies celebrities, and it gives you uh, uh, information about who this is. It looks like it's Elizabeth II with a confidence of 0.92, which I would agree with. And I don't know if I was this guy, I would be getting right out of my chair really fast. Um, but, but just integrating, we have a lot of knowledge of vision and we have not, not a lot logic, uh, not a knowledge of language. Let's put those together and do some really um, interesting applications. Multilingual is another um, difficult, um, difficult problem. There are many, many, many languages in the world, thousands of languages, um, and some of them have many millions of speakers that we haven't even uh, started looking at. So um, I, asked, uh, I asked Alexa and Siri about some languages. Let's see. Alexa, do you speak Japanese? I can speak several languages. To switch your language, go to Alexa devices in the Alexa app, choose your device, and select language. Well, that wasn't really the answer, was it? Um, but at least Alexa knew that Japanese was a language. Uh, so another one that I tried with it was, I was asking about Zulu, which is actually a very big language. There's um, 10 million speakers in South Africa. Uh, Alexa, do you speak Zulu? Sorry, I'm not sure. So yeah, I didn't even know that Zulu was a language. Um, let's see, I think. Hey Siri, do you speak Zulu? Okay, I'm gonna skip that one because um, uh, she went on and on and on. She enumerated all the languages she speaks, which was about 20. So we don't need to hear all that, but um, it, didn't, it didn't really answer the question. Uh, so then um, moving on to the more, more and more interesting capabilities, uh, prosody is a really interesting one. Um, that's, uh, I'm sure you, know what prosody is, but the emphasis and timing and pitch of language of, as opposed to the words, um, there's a lot to be done there. And um, it's very good. I think yesterday I heard a lot of good examples from Google about their work on prosody. It's very good for straightforward short utterances. So four score and seven years ago our I didn't want to do that one. I wanted to do the time, which is very straightforward. Let's see. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth. It was the worst of the time as an elimination of received liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. It was the epoch of incredulity. The time is 11 a.m. The time is 11 a.m. Darkness. It was the spring of hope. I'm going to skip prosody. I'm just going to offer you the chance to pick out something like, I, I was looking at the uh, beginning of The Tale of Two Cities. It's a famous literary passage, and it sounds um, really dumb with, um, with current prosody, because the longer and longer the passage is that you're reading, the more the meaning of the, of the actual meaning contributes to the right prosody. And uh, if, you're just saying what time it is. You can you can do the prosody properly for that. But if you're um, if you're reading some literature with a lot of meaning and rich connotations, uh, it starts to sound robotic pretty fast. So I want to talk about a, another um, really interesting uh, area that hasn't had much work. Uh, what? I, I think we got the idea, <laughs> thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the, this is the idea of grounding, which, which has several meanings, but one meaning is to actually relate language to the senses, information from our senses, and use that to, to learn language and from uh, getting sensory information and interacting with the world. 
Uh, so you might be playing with a baby and say, that's a red ball, and that's a blue ball, and the two balls are exactly the same except for their color. That ch child is going to learn what red and blue are really fast. They're going to be able to um, see that they have these two objects and, and relate that to the language that, um, that they're hearing and understand, um, understand what red and blue mean. And you could do things like all kinds of physical properties, like this ball is heavy, this ball is light, and that child is going to learn very fast what heavy and light mean. Uh, we have to teach our virtual assistants, OK, red is, you know, whatever red is, blue is this, um, this is a ball, this is heavy, this is light. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of progress in vision, so we might, there probably are plenty of systems that can identify a red ball, but I think identifying a heavy ball, um, I don't think that we can do that. Um, so finally, the most difficult and important property of our systems that we don't really have is the ability to carry on an extended productive conversation. Um, a couple of presentations in the last couple of days have talked about digressions and interruptions, um, like uh, I want to go from Washington to Port Portland on the 23rd. The system says there are 10 flights from Washington to Portland on the 23rd. And then the user says, wants to do a digression and says, oh, what, by the way, what do I have to do to bring my cat? Uh, well, it might be very important in picking a flight to know what the, pro you know, the cat process is. Um, so the digression is important. It's not just uh, you know, going off the track. Um, this is, this is different, difficult for today's systems. Um, another thing that I think is very difficult is remembering earlier interactions and earlier conversations, like uh, what was that last statistic you gave me about the Phillies? That could have been you know, half an hour ago. Um, and you know, people can remember that they talked about something half an hour ago. Or my favorite uh, problem is, what were we just talking about? I would really like my system to be able to remind me uh, what I was talking about, or ideally what I was thinking about. Um, that's, that's another capability we, we uh, aren't going to get into today. But anyway, and then talking about the future, um, remind me to tell you a joke that I've just heard. So maybe we're talking about something. I don't really, really want to interrupt the flow of conversation, but, but I do want to remember to do this. So I, um, as Bob said, I've been coming to speech tech since 1996, and I had a lot of optimism about where we were going to be in the future with all of these technologies. So I actually could not um, make my slides from 1996 work. Uh, PowerPoint said I never saw this format before. But I did find my slides from 1998. And these are slides I actually presented at Speech Tech in 1998. And um, I, as you can see, I had a optimistic idea of upward progress as applications change. And um, I was saying, OK, well, what, um, what applications are doing now? There are specific focus interactions. User knows what they want. Um, there's things like catalog ordering. Uh, stock quotes is a big application then. And air travel was also a big application. So that's what we could do then. Um, and when I thought about the year 2000, I thought it was time for us to be able to do wide-ranging problem-solving interactions where the users don't really know what they want, uh, uh, like something like a personal shopper or a financial advisor or a travel agent. And uh, what we could do now is airline reservations where uh, the user knew what city they would wanted to leave from, they wanted to leave from San Jose, they wanted to go to New York, on what date, October 26th. 
And then, so that was kind of the state of the art in 1998. And my vision of the 2000 state of the art would be a travel agent that could explore alternative scenarios. If I leave earlier, can I get a window seat? How much money will I save if I leave on Sunday instead? Um, knows the limits of its abilities. <clears throat> can you help me with the rental car? Um, and allow users to change their mind. Um, and saying things like being able to say, I'd, I'd rather leave at noon. Uh, so I think um, time is getting short, so I want to just finish up. Just like talking to a human, we've come a long way. We still have a ways to go. We're making a lot of progress, and we'll see how things go next year. Maybe, maybe there'll be some new, um, new capabilities we talk about at Speech Tech 2020. So thank you. I don't know if we have time for any questions or we need to get to the next talks. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. So uh, yeah, the question was, uh, will I upload my presentation? And I'll, I'll do that on the uh, Speech Check website. So if you have any questions that you want to ask me later, I'll be here all day. And uh, thank, you, thank you again for your attention.